stay focused, stay positive, and keep telling yourself that this is a season of life. And try your best to find things to take your mind off of the stress you may be feeling. It's easy to get down on yourself, but always remember you have something to offer. And eventually, this season will end. Hooray to Derek. Number two, this is from Ivy Bruce. And she has a new position as an implementation coordinator in Boston with EverFi. It has been my dream to move to Boston, but amidst the pandemic and with limited understanding of the job search process, finding a job that would bring this dream to life seemed next to impossible. In January of 2021, I decided it was time to prioritize my job search efforts and reached out to the Alumni Career Services for guidance on this journey. I met with Alumni Career Services and could not be more grateful for their guidance and wisdom. Within four months, I was afforded the opportunity to interview with a few wonderful companies. I was offered a job and underwent successful salary negotiations with said job offer. I'm so excited to announce that I will be sharing a new role at the end of this month and finally making my Boston dreams come true this summer. None of this would have been possible without the help of the Alumni Career Services and Job Club. Thank you for helping me make this dream come true. I'm extremely grateful for your guidance and for being my biggest cheerleader along the way. I'm so excited to start this next chapter in my life and to all those currently in the job seeking process. I wish you the best of luck in your search and hope you know you have wonderful people in your corner with the Alumni Career Services and Job Club. Number three, this is from Robin Mayberry, Clinical Quality and Program Director at UK, new position for her. I lost my job in September 2020. After searching my emails, I found an email from the Alumni Career Services announcing the Job Club webinar series. I began attending the webinars in October. They were a lifesaver. They gave me such needed skills for job seekers in today's competitive job market, and I was able to use the skills they provided with resume writing and establishing and updating my LinkedIn profile to assist me with my job search. Attending the webinars also gave me something to look forward to, which provided hope during my downtime. I also utilize the free services they offer, such as re resume review and virtual interview preparation, which helped me in preparing for interviews and applying for jobs. I am so thankful for this service that UK offers. I feel the skills that I attained from the webinars were invaluable and helped me to land my job here at the University of Kentucky. I am so thankful and grateful to the UK Alumni Career Services Center and Job Club for hosting the webinars and providing these services. I would definitely recommend the services to job seekers. A final word of encouragement to all job seekers, don't give up hope, don't, no matter how long it takes, there is a job out there for you. Wow. <laughs> and last but not least, we have um, a success story from Becca Rorick and her new position is a downstream controller with Snyder Electric. I knew that I needed to make a career change. I was a member of the UK Alumni Association and I saw that members were eligible for free career sessions. So she decided to give it a try and she's so glad she did. I was very interested in working at UK and it applied with little luck. The career services provided helpful information about the best way to apply to UK, but did inform me that it would be difficult to get your foot in the door. They helped with my LinkedIn profile and suggested networking events to attend Job Club. I was intrigued with Job Club. So I attended an in-person meeting where I was introduced to UK STEPS recruiters. They told me all about the STEPS program and how it was a great way to get into UK. That day, I found a UK STEPS job that enticed me and applied and I got the job after revising my resume, my cover letter, LinkedIn profile, and job club suggestions. It could not have happened without job club. I soon discovered that about the educational benefits of working for UK and began the MBA program in the fall of 2018. 
And through the MBA program, I have managed to stay in touch with Caroline, who reaches out and helps with various networking events. I soon found myself graduating in May 2021 and learning there may be more opportunities I could pursue with the MBA degree. So she started meeting with Caroline again in September 2020, and she once again vastly improved resume, cover letters, and LinkedIn profile. I began applying to roles with my updated resumes and cover letters and was able to secure multiple phone, Zoom, and in-purpose job interviews. Referring to the interview resources provided by Job Club, I was offered two different positions. She discussed these, the pros and cons with Caroline and decided to pursue the supply chain position. Career choices and decisions are overwhelming for all people of all ages and it is very easy to make the wrong choices and follow dead leads. However, working with the Alumni Career Services and Job Club, I felt like I had a whole team in my corner and an absolutely incredible support system. Through meeting various exciting people and discovering more about myself, as well as landing a great opportunity, I could not be more appreciative of the work that Caroline did with me, Job Club, and the Alumni Career Services Association. So what more, I have nothing more to add to these four incredible success stories, but all of them, um, the common thread here is they are giving you encouragement. Um, I think they are validating um, the services and the um, information and help that Job Club can provide for you. And we want you, we look forward to sharing your success story in the very near future. And without further ado, we would like to bring up our panel. This is always one of our most popular programs. Once a year, we have a recruiter HR panel where we get to hear job search tips and strategies from their side of the table. These are the folks that are in the trenches every day, hiring people, screening applicants, and thrilled with our panel today. I'll introduce each panelist and I'll let them tell a little more about their company and what type of positions they're sourcing for. I have a series of questions to ask, but do feel free to add in the chat box questions you would like for us to include. And at the end, we'll address some of those questions. Uh, so let's begin with Mike Henderson. Mike is with UK Steps. And Mike, why don't you share a little bit about STEPS and if there's anything that you're particularly sourcing for right now that you would like to promote, please do that as well. Yeah, uh, so like she said, I'm, I'm with UK STEPS. We're temporary employment uh, for the University of Kentucky. Uh, we cover both campus, the education side of UK and also support UK healthcare. Um, so there's really a very broad variety of positions that we, we have posted right now. There's uh, almost 50 jobs that are, are available right now at UK Through Steps, um, going from maintenance to uh, administrative to a wide variety of medical positions and, and some more specialized roles too. Um, I think the big priority is, is of course healthcare right now as it has been uh, seemingly since the beginning of time at this point. but. Um, Certainly, if you have any type of any kind of experience, uh, we can we can certainly work with you and find something um, to match, hopefully close to what you're looking for, or what you're hoping to become. Great. Thank you, Mike. Next, Summer Jensen with App Harvest. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks. I'm, uh, I'm Summer Jensen. I'm the Director of HR Business Partners for App Harvest, and we are an ag tech startup here in Lexington, Kentucky. We are, we're hiring for several positions. We, uh, we just acquired a robotics organization out of Boston. So we, you know, the types of roles that we're looking for right now include corporate positions. We also have a lot of agriculture type positions, growers, more technical assistant grower roles. We, uh, we're also looking for robotics professionals. So really we have a wide range of positions that we're recruiting for and if you're interested, please take a look at, at our website, reach out to myself on LinkedIn, connect, happy to, happy to be here and happy to chat with the other panelists and all of you. Summer, it's been really fun to watch App Harvest grow. And I have to say, I did have my first App Harvest tomato um, that I bought at Kroger a week or two ago and it was quite delicious. So thank yes, you. Yes, love to hear that, thank you. 
Andrea Murray with East Kentucky Power, you're next. Well, thank you. I'm Andrea. Um, like she said, I'm with East Kentucky Power. So we are a utility company uh, headquartered out of Winchester. And I kind of like to say we go where LG and EKU doesn't go. So we provide electricity to rural Kentucky. Um, we are located, our lines go across the entire state of Kentucky. We've got about seven locations and we have plants that range from coal fire, um, combustion turbine, we have some landfill, we have a solar farm um, and, and we're working on the renewable energy side. Um, we are in Kentucky, so we're primary coal. Some of the positions we have, we're always looking for engineers, all types, civil, electrical, chemical. Um, currently I'm working on a tax and payroll supervisor role, kind of a hybrid, really fun um, break-in role for anybody that's in, interested in that kind of thing. Um, but we also hire linemen, plant operators, mechanics, electricians, everything that it takes to run a power plant in those lines. So very happy to be here and looking forward to talking to everyone. Thank you for your long-term support of Job Club as well. Yes, and Jared Wilcox. Jared, you have also been a supporter of Job Club since the very beginning and have served on multiple panels. And we so appreciate your support. And also the people that you've been able to hire through the years from Job Club. You've hired several people. Yeah, thanks for having me, Caroline. It's good to see you. It's been a while since we've uh, got to see each other and face-to-face, -face, I guess. But yeah, we've we've definitely been a, a long-term partner, I guess, with Job Club over the years and have worked with a number of individuals and helping them to find careers, uh, you know, throughout that time. So we appreciate what you guys do. Um, good morning, Job Club. Again, I'm Jared Wilcox with Aerotech. Uh, we're a national recruiting uh, company. We hire for a variety of jobs from the industrial, administrative, uh, into more technical and engineering. I'm a practice lead for our engineering group um, for Central Kentucky. So we work with a number of companies in the area, uh, primarily focusing more on more manufacturing, engineering, quality controls, uh, things of that nature. So I'm glad to be here. Great. I'll address a couple of people on the panel for each question, but if you have something to add panelists, please, we welcome your insight. First question, and I'll begin with um, uh, Jared. How has COVID changed recruiting efforts for your company? What's different now than pre-COVID? Yeah, I mean, for us, a lot of our recruiting obviously is done on the phones. I mean, we have a, we have an office of recruiters just here in Lexington alone that you know, their job is basically um, on the phones all day, trying to network with individuals and and find good fits for the companies we work with. But, you know, for us, we've been obviously using a lot of Teams, WebEx. I mean, we're on a Zoom call here today, you know, to connect with people. In the past, I feel like we would spend a lot more time meeting locally with a lot of those people doing, you know, things like lunches and coffees. But a lot of that's been replaced with kind of virtual meetings. So, um, you know, I think that's probably kind of the obvious since everybody's kind of moved to, to the virtual side of it. The other, I mean, we have seen kind of an, an uptick for recruiters um, using LinkedIn to recruit more with individuals than in the past. So just a few things that we've seen. Who else would like to add something on the panel on how things have changed uh, since pre-COVID? The additions, okay. Moving on to our next question. And let's begin on this one with Andrea. What gets your attention on a candidate's resume? And also on that, maybe share what gets people screened out that you see. So the good and the bad and what you see um, on the resume. And this will be tremendous advice for our audience today. So I'm sure lots of note taking will occur. Well, in, in my experience, I, I like to see a little meat on the bone, so to speak. So in your resume, a lot of resumes now read like a job description. Um, it's easy to go Google the job you're looking for, the job that you had, and kind of copy and paste those bullets into your resume. And that's kind of the cookie cutter um, type of thing that we're seeing. So I like to see kind of an action result impact sort of bullet. What was the action that you took at that job? What was the result and what was the impact? So, you know, worked on redefine, re, 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 I can't talk, redesigning a piece of equipment, you know, place the bid, save the company a million dollars. Numbers are really good, quantify, you know, quantify what you've actually done. 
Um, some of the things that will get you screened out quickly, I see cover letters with uh, wrong companies on it. If you're applying to multiple positions and you're applying for an electrician job and you say, hey, I'm applying for your mechanic job, those are pretty straightforward ones. So attention to detail, especially if you are kind of a jack of all trades or looking for multiple roles, just make sure that you do upload the right resume. It's okay to have multiple versions, just make sure that you're, you're tailoring that resume. Um, other things I do, you know, to make your resume really stand out these days, I like cover letters. You know, it's, it's an easy paragraph or so just to tell me a little bit about yourself, maybe why you're in the job market and some of your, your key achievements and how that would play into the role that we're searching for. I, I I'll it. pass Jared it over to see if it, Summer or Jared have anything else, but. Yeah, and I appreciate you mentioning that about cover letters. Sometimes people do not realize how important that they can be. Mm -hmm. All right, Summer, what would you add? I think that I, I agree with that. The, my notes here mentioned making sure that your resume is applicable to the job posting. I think that for me is probably the quickest, the quickest way to get my attention and to screen a, a candidate out. If you have a wealth of knowledge, but you aren't specifically calling out words in the job posting, oftentimes you're going to get overlooked. Good to know. Mike, I know with UK, the application's really important. So would you share a little more about the application as, as well as the resume, what gets yeah. people screened in and out? Yeah, so different people have their, their own different preferences at UK. Some prefer to just look at the resume, some only look at the application. Um, and so by copy and pasting, you're, you're often leaving information out there. Um, like Andrew, Andrea said, um, Kind of putting meat on the bone and quantifying what you're doing. Uh, I've, the advice that I've I've heard frequently is to write your resume as though you're making a pitch for to your supervisor for a raise. Um, talk about what you've accomplished, and then on the application, talk about your job description, what you did in the day to day. Um, <clears throat> so often, what you'll see is someone just copy and pastes or just put C resume, and that's real quick to get ruled out. Just because of the, the laziness that's put into it. Um, even copy and pasting is, is fine, just to have something written for someone to look at. Because like I said, uh, some people only look at the application, some only look at the resume. So if you're leaving something out, then you're ruling yourself out. Mike, at least for UK, we always encourage clients to think of the resume and the application as standalone pieces. And you definitely um, just reiterated the importance of having each completely filled out um, because you never know from which department to, you know, which department, um, what they're preferring to look at. Um, Jared, did you have anything to add for that? Yeah, I, mean, I would agree with a lot of what's been said already. Um, I, I would add, you know, it sounds like a simple thing, but organization on a resume is key. Um, sometimes we'll see resumes that are very uh, difficult to read, we'll say. So you know, my advice would be use bullet points instead of large scrolling paragraphs that explain maybe what you were doing in a job. And, you know, again, laying out quantifying numbers, I think is always key and being able to sell yourself. Two follow-up questions for you. Um, in the past, we've always taught clients that they want to stay away from template resumes, to stay away from tables and columns because they could have scanning issues. If you all could weigh in on that for me. Also, we've had a question on your feeling on putting a picture on a resume. So I welcome your feedback on those. And um, Mike, would you begin? Yes, um, so we'll start with the, the picture. I know that is uh, a polarizing topic in many cases, and that's more of a general generational uh, preference. Uh, my personal preference is to just avoid it, because um, having your picture, um, you know, certainly gives a lot of demographic information. Um, so you don't want to put someone else at risk. And some uh, recruiters that I know, if they see any picture of any kind, they just throw it right in the trash to avoid any possible litigation. Um, and plus, if they want to see your picture, then they'll dive into your, your LinkedIn account. Um, and I apologize, what was the, the first part of that question? Um, on ATS systems, um, templated resumes, tables, columns, what gets through and what doesn't? Um, certain templates, I know, especially different uh, colors or designs, uh, often uh, mark over top of what's been written. 
Um, so I've seen a lot of names and contact information that gets erased or covered up by certain templates. Um, and just the same, you know, making sure your format's okay. Um, but also, uh, in many cases, it's better to save your resume or cover letter as a PDF, because uh, that translates uh, from one system to another uh, in different operating systems uh, better than just simply a Word document. Okay, good to know. Please chime in, Andrea. You know, I, I personally touch every resume. We don't have, um, you know, mass quantities of, of, of applications. Um, so it, it doesn't necessarily um, relate to, to our applicant tracking system. But a lot of times when I do pull those in and download them, if you've got different tables, sometimes it will fudge the numbers and it will kind of add in explanation points and, and uh, question marks. So I would just say, keep it simple. Um, I don't like pictures either. So it, for legal purposes, personal, for legal and personal reasons. So uh, if you avoid it, like you said, if we want to know more about you, we can, we can search LinkedIn. So. Jared, do you have anything you'd like to add there? Uh, I would agree with those two as far as the pictures go. As far as our ATS system, I mean, it's, it's not going to screen things out if you've got a table or something like that set up. But, you know, I would agree uh, sometimes for whatever reason, when it formats, you know, you get the question marks as bullets or, or things that kind of look weird. So to me, not using a table is, is probably going to be more helpful for you. Okay, good. Tables and columns. Summer, what would you add? I think I agree. Um, Michael said to PDF the resume. That's one thing that I think helps the most to avoid any formatting issues. And that piece, that's probably the one thing I would add. And with pictures, I agree for personal and professional purposes. I would recommend leaving that off. Okay. One last thing to add, Caroline, too, you know, a lot of, there are a lot of templates online that you can Google and download. And some of the things, again, it goes back to attention to detail. They'll say, you know, add this, 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 and give an explanation of that. And a lot of times people forget to delete that part of the template. And so just again, attention to detail, read your resume, have somebody else read your resume, put it away, read it again, another couple of days, go finger, you know, it just, Attention to detail is huge because you do get a number of applicants and it is easy to rule someone out, especially if it's in a high attention to detail position. Okay, let's switch to telephone screening interviews. Um, these are happening more and more with COVID and even Zoom as the replacing the telephone screening interview. Share with us some strategies to get past that screening interview. What's the purpose of the telephone screening interview from your perspective? And what strategies do you recommend that our job seekers um, follow to help them move to the next level? Jared, would you begin? Yeah, for, for us, I would say the purpose of a telephone interview is really just to make sure that they can clearly communicate with another person and that they can do simple things like uh, be on time. You know, if, if an appointment is set up at three o'clock in the afternoon, is the person ready at that time? Are they going to be, you know, able to talk through the position and, and understand? As a recruiter, too, it also helps us identify any areas for coaching or counseling. So mm -hmm. if we speak with somebody that maybe tends to ramble on a little bit more than they should or taking several minutes to answer a response, um, that's going to allow us to address it with that person before we potentially move forward with another step. Who else would like to chime in here? I can go ahead and jump in. Um, we use the phone interview to really hone in on technical abilities. Um, you can say anything on a resume, honestly. And so you, we usually, you know, use four or five questions that really hone in on the technical capabilities. And then once we get past that, if we feel they're qualified, then we move to the second more behavioral type interview to really look at cultural and motivational fit. You know, if it's a supervisor role, lead, dive into leadership skills. Uh, so that's how, that's how we're doing it at East Kentucky. Okay, Mike, were you gonna add something? Yeah, uh, so at UK, at least in the steps office, uh, the phone screen is, is just a 10 minute conversation. Um, it's nothing certainly to be nervous about. We're just trying to get an understanding of uh, your past experience. Um, so there's no trick questions, nothing to really think about, um, but we're just kind of looking to match your experience with the job at hand. 
uh, and then hopefully get a, a quick feel for uh, for your character and what it is that you're looking for more specifically. So it's just a friendly conversation uh, before we move on to a more formal interview. Okay, Summer, any additional comments on that? Yeah, I think the one thing I would add here is, remember this is the first interaction with the organization that you're having. And it's as much you interviewing the organization as they are you. And really for us, this first phone interview is a conversation like the other panelists have said to one, ensure that the technical skill set aligns, but also to, to make sure that any must haves for this specific position are items that, that you as a candidate can do. So again, I would reference that job posting. If you've got specific experience tied back to that job posting, be prepared to share that so that it's very clear that you are a qualified candidate for this position. Great. And I've got a little tip, you know, when you're preparing for a phone interview, take it just as serious as a Zoom, um, you know, get dressed up. Don't just sit in your pajamas on the couch, on the phone. Um, I suggest you get up, you walk around, you stand up, um, your, your voice projects better. Uh, I feel like you're a little bit more focused. Um, and so we're, we're taking it pretty seriously. So you should too. It's not just a, a uh, sit on your couch and, and and work through it. So, Good advice. Let's move in to the interview a little more. Um, if I can have you all share Zoom advice or any best practices, you know, maybe, you know, what you've seen that has not been um, quite um, successful and what good candidates do on in Zoom interviews. Also, if you would share with us two or three of your most common interview questions that people should be prepared to answer. Summer, let's have you begin on that one. Zoom advice and common interview questions. Okay, so I think my, my first piece of advice for Zoom is to look at the camera. Uh, it's easy to get caught looking at yourself, wanting to make sure that, that you, know, you don't have a stray hair or something. And looking at the camera is helpful. Uh, smiling, blinking, I've been in interviews before where candidates get so nervous that they just stare at the screen. And it's, it's okay to pause, it's okay to take a sip of water, it's a conversation. <clears throat> Remember to, to breathe and, and just take a moment. I think for me, the three questions that I will always ask, I always like to ask candidates Tell me a little bit more about your experience and why you're interested in this role. That helps me understand what it is about the position that they were at first attracted to. The second piece I like to focus on is tell me about a time when you went above and beyond. And the third piece for me is I want to, I want to understand their self-awareness. And so I like to ask, tell me something that you do really well and share something that is an opportunity for you. And it's not so much around learning what their weaknesses are, it's really around that self-awareness to understand this is something that I am working on and here's how I'm addressing that. Good opportunity for someone to share their Clifton strengths and some examples to back it up. Exactly, exactly. Like, Jared, why don't you share next? Yeah, I mean, as far as Zoom interview, I guess best practices, I would say find a quiet space, um, try to find a space free from maybe dogs and children if possible. I know it's been difficult for me over COVID. Um, have a clean background. You know, if you can find a spot at your home or wherever that, you know, is not showing maybe like a bathroom or a bedroom in the background, that's probably going to be better. Maybe use a virtual background if you need to. Um, and then I think Andrea mentioned, you know, for the phone interview, dress like you're, you're going to the, to an, to an actual face-to-face -face interview. I mean, I would, I would definitely recommend, you know, wear a suit, you know, wear what you would normally wear to an in-person interview. Um, and then practice beforehand. Uh, it's funny. I mean, so we're, we do a lot of technical recruiting here and work with a lot of engineers that you would think, um, would be able to easily use a WebEx camera. Um, but you know, we've seen some struggles over the past year and sometimes it's funny, right? Like you get an interview where somebody's forehead is, is right up against the camera or something like that. And so, you know, be prepared to at least practice that. So, you know, that your camera and your mic's working, um, because there's nothing more frustrating than get on an interview and all of a sudden somebody can't get one of those things to work. Um, 
Summer mentioned several questions that I think are great interview questions to ask. Um, the tell me about a time when I'm sure you all have probably talked about it on job club before, but star questions, you know, your situation, task, action, result questions that, um, you can give specific and cite specific examples of what you did, um, during a certain, whatever that question is, I think is key. So, you know, just being prepared to really recall stories and things that you've done in the past, uh, is going to be important. Good advice, Mike. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, one of the things I think you can do to best prepare for really any interview is to just kind of adjust your mindset in, into something more positive. So focus on what you have accomplished, uh, what you are excited about with this company or with this position, and have those uh, as answers ready to go uh, when the opportunity arrives. And that'll kind of help your, your posture, your poise, and your presentation as well. Um, and also, don't be afraid to take notes. Uh, they allow you to kind of buy some time as you think of your answer. Uh, I know when I'm interviewing, I write down the question. So if I happen to go blank, I've got that to go back to. Um, and if I struggle with it, then I've got that question that they asked me so I can practice that answer for the next interview. Um, because that next interview is going to come eventually. Um, <clears throat> and like they said, just uh, being prepared for it as though it is any other interview, whether it's the first or the fourth interview you've had with the company, make sure you're presented well uh, and put together as though you're about to meet them face to face. Um, you know, that all comes back to that mindset and um, that presents you better and hopefully puts you in a better light for the company. I always tell clients, we're all going to have lots of jobs in our lifetime. So that means lots of interviews. And this is something that people traditionally are not comfortable with. I'm yet to meet with a client that says, oh, I can't wait for the next interview or I can't wait to job search. Um, so, but the more we do it, the easier it gets. Andrea, what would you add um, to uh, interview questions that people should be prepared to answer? I always wanna know what makes you interested in my company and then the role specifically. Um, and we get uh, people that just kind of need a job or want a job and that's fine. But if you're interviewing and you get to the zoo, make sure that you go to the website and do a little bit of research on the company and understand. I think we were interviewing somebody and they said, so are you Cole? And we're like, yeah, if you would have gone to the website, that wouldn't have been a question. Um, and I always kind of help people prep for interviews. Uh, we use the STAR method in behavioral interview questions. So just Google behavioral interview questions, hundreds will pop up. And then look at the, the job description. And if there's key competencies or requirements on there, look at those behavioral questions that might relate to that competency and then prepare an answer. And like Mike said, it's okay to have notes and prepare yourself. Um, and I just always, you know, come up with four or five really good examples of a past experience that could relate to a lot of those different competencies. So you're more prepared and not just fumbling for an answer. Summer, next question I want to direct to you. Uh, tell us how you're using LinkedIn or other social media to recruit. And then also I'd like to hear how you may use that to screen as well once you have a finalist. Yeah, so we, <clears throat> we use every social media platform pretty much for, for posting. And LinkedIn specifically for our, co our corporate positions. Uh, we also use Indeed, and our recruiters will spend hours looking on LinkedIn to try and source candidates. We are, I mentioned we're a startup, we're out of Kentucky, and we have, you know, we're looking across the country for talent. And so LinkedIn is an easy way to be able to sift through specific skill sets and levels that we need, and then go and look at those candidates. So. Um, I think for, for that piece, we, we oftentimes will reach out with LinkedIn messaging to see if someone may be interested in having a conversation with us. And that is, that, that in fact, that's how I was recruited. I've only been here two months. And, you know, that's, that's really one area that our recruiters will focus on. And the, I think the suggestion there, there's a, uh, respond even if you're not even if you're not looking make sure that you respond because it may open up an opportunity in the future for another position or another opportunity 
I'll add to that. Please make sure job seekers that in your settings on LinkedIn, you check the box uh, willing to be contacted by recruiters or open to be contacted by recruiters. Uh, by doing so, you will come up higher on their search engines. And as Summer mentioned, recruiters extensively use LinkedIn to recruit. Jared, I know you all do as well. Anything you would add about um, LinkedIn and using that um, when you source that would help, help our job seekers? Yeah, I mean, you just pointed on the open to work. I think that, you know, just so you know, from, you know, the LinkedIn recruiter side, I mean, there are essentially search functions that our recruiters can use, and that's that's an option that they can select. So if you're not checking that box, I would be sure you're checking it. Um, and then to Summer's point, I mean, we're a recruiting company. I, I would, my advice would be definitely respond if a recruiter reaches out to you. If it's something not in your field or way off, you know, and off base, I mean, just feel free to let that recruiter know, um, you know, that's their job and they're probably sending a lot of those messages out in the day. Um, so, um, you know, don't hesitate to, to contact or be in contact with them uh, or be intimidated in any way. Great, great advice. Um, let's let's switch to a different question. We do have a lot of partners that participate in our webinars for Job Club that are with Goodwill and Voc Rehab. And this question I really would like to address so um, it could help them with their clients uh, and, and just any of us as well. Uh, if a candidate needs special accommodations, how do you prefer the candidate handles this? At what point in the process? And whoever uh, would like to answer that first, um, just chime in. So we usually don't um, take that uh, into consideration until we're at an offer. Um, you know, if, if there are obviously, um, you know, communication accommodations that need to be made up front, that's nice to know because, of course, we'll accommodate where we can. But usually we won't get into that, you know, um, some of our plant jobs, we do read through the job description at the beginning of the interview and say, does this sound like everything that you can do and are we good? And, and, and we'll go, through, go, go from there, but we usually don't get there until the offer. Okay, others? Yeah, very early on in our I'll interview add. process, oh, sorry, Summer, um, uh, we wrap up our interview uh, with just a very simple yes, no question. Can you perform this job with or without reasonable accommodation? And the answer is hopefully yes. Um, and if you do need any reasonable accommodation, uh, like Andrea said, uh, that comes uh, with the offer. Uh, we There's a form that we add into all of the new hire paperwork where you work with our uh, accommodation office, the EEO office, um, and uh, they work to get whatever equipment or, or services you may need. Okay, Summer? I think what I would add there is it depends. If it's, if it's an accommodation that you need for the interview process, I would say the sooner the better. If it's an accommodation that you may need after an offer is extended, then as long as you've said, I can do the job with or without an accommodation, then at that point you would work with the HR team to work through that accommodation, so. Great. This question we get a lot, so I'm really anxious for you all to share from your perspective. When should clients follow up? How should they follow up? And how frequently should they follow up? I know people are very nervous about following up. So um, give us your advice on following up after an interview. Jared? Yep, yeah, I'll, I'll get started. Um, you know, my advice would be follow up for one immediately with some sort of response, uh, like a thank you or follow up email or letter um, direct to the manager that you that you interviewed with. Um, as far as following up with recruiters, I would say, you know, be sure and ask in the interview, hey, when, you know, what is your timeline for this or, or when when should I follow up? You know, try to have that conversation on the front end so that, you know, if, if you are trying to reach out every day after the interview, I mean, you never know if, if there are other candidates that are interviewing or maybe you're just the first of several, you know, maybe over the next week or two of interviews that are already scheduled. So as long as you're having that conversation up front, hopefully it'll give you a better idea of, of what timing makes sense. What about after submitting the resume? How long should people wait to follow up? Uh, I mean, I would say, you know, again, it's probably more dependent on the position, but 
you know, within two or three days, you know, especially if you're working through a recruiter, um, don't hesitate to, to ping that recruiter and say, hey, um, you know, have you heard anything? Or just ask the recruiter, hey, what, what's your plan on this? Um, you know, are you, are you just sending a resume to a manager? Do you have a meeting scheduled with a manager when they're going to discuss uh, maybe a specific resume? So I think it's fair to, to do that and have that conversation direct with the recruiter too. Mike? Uh, well, for uh, reaching out after as a follow-up, you know, I'd recommend certainly within two days max uh, with everything being done online, um, my interviews are scheduled a little bit more tightly than they used to be. Um, so, you know, making sure you follow up soon, uh, just as a quick refresher to that uh, recruiter or interviewer uh, about your, your uh, skills and just refresh their memory about you as a person. Um, but then also be sure to reply to any email that they send. Um, even if it's just the interview invite itself, uh, you know, with, uh, I believe it's with Google or Gmail, um, clicking yes, uh, will show you, um, will show up on their calendar that you've accepted the invite, but also reply to that email, acknowledging that you've received it and, and answer any questions you might have, uh, preliminarily there. Um, but then for following up, uh, with the resumes, uh, UK is a little bit different. So for our, our staff positions, uh, no one sees the application until that posting has closed. So it doesn't matter if you applied the first day it was posted or an hour before it closed. Uh, all of those applications are, are essentially locked until that posting is closed. Um, so I would wait for UK. Again, we're a very unique in, uh, institution. Um, I'd wait maybe a week or two after uh, that posting's closed before following up. Okay, I have another uh, couple of questions, then we'll open it up to the panel. Great advice. Thank you all so much. What advice would you give on salary negotiation? Uh, that's another area that people are very uncomfortable with. So if you have a couple of little um, tips you could give on just general salary negotiation or negotiating in general an offer, what would that be? Summer? I always recommend negotiating. Whatever the offer is, negotiate. And the reason for that is companies and recruiters expect that. It's a, it's again, it's a conversation back and forth. And we want you to be 100% comfortable taking a, an offer that, we, that we've extended. And if you're not, and you take it anyway, that typically results in lower engagement. So, I would do, I would recommend doing some homework on the area. If it's, you know, if it's out of the area that you live in, do some research on what, what you believe that salary range may be if it hasn't been provided to you. And depending on your experience, give an example. Say this is a great offer based on my experience, this, this, and this, I can provide this skill set. I feel like I, I would like to see this number. And, you know, and then, and then leave it at that and let the organization think about it and come back to you. Good advice. All right. Any others and then um, that would like to chime in on that and then we'll open it up to questions. We've had several questions come in. Yeah, Just real quick, it, the negotiation doesn't have to be about a, a number of salary either. If you want some vacation, ask for the extra vacation. Um, but, but, you know, don't, it, don't ask for something that you're willing to take and, and not that don't shoot for the moon, because if they say, say no, they're probably going to say no and move on to the next candidate. So be realistic in your negotiation. Okay. Last question is regarding references. What advice would you give for choosing references and how to prep your references? Uh, Jared? Yeah, for references, I would just say if you're going to look someone as a reference, ask them first uh, if it's okay, if they can, if you can use that person. Um, you know, typically what I see with references is, is somebody is not going to list someone as a reference normally if, uh, if they don't feel like they're going to say something good about them. Um, that being said, you know, I've been with, at Aerotech for 10 years and I have been surprised a few times when you fall up with a reference and it's, it's negative, um, you know, which can be difficult, uh, you know, obviously, and, and moving forward with a, with a candidate if you hear something that's, that's that negative. But um, yeah, just ask, um, you know, I think is probably key. Okay. Who else would like to add? Also, just making sure that 
they are people that you've worked with in the past. Um, a lot of people will list friends or pastors, and that's great. I'm glad they'll put in a good word for you, but they aren't going to be able to answer the questions that I have for them about your uh, work experience and work ethic. Awesome. Thank you, panelists. This has been fabulous. I'm going to turn it over to Amanda now. She's been screening all of our wonderful questions that have come in from the audience, and we'll do a very quick lightning round um, on those questions that have come in. All right, panelists, what we'll do for this one is I'll, we'll just have one person respond each round. We'll try to keep it to 30 seconds or less because we have got about 10 questions to come through. All right, first one is for Mike specifically. How would you recommend following up with an application at UK? I've applied for several positions. Don't always see a specific person or recruiter to follow up with. And that's by design. Uh, we try to keep everything as closed off as we can for um, just for fairness for uh, the department doing the screening uh, and all of the other applicants that, that may or may not be following up. Um, but certainly feel free to call us at Central HR. We might be able to give you an update as to where that posting may be in the process. Um, but certainly, uh, first and foremost, patience with our process. We take a long time to fill our positions. We are very slow at it. Uh, so be patient, but also uh, apply to anything and everything you might be interested in or qualified for. Uh, there's nothing wrong with applying to 300 jobs at UK. Um, very few people will see that you've applied to 300 jobs. They'll only see what they have access to. Um, so don't be afraid to put yourself out there. Be patient and be persistent. Great advice. Thank you. All right, Andrea, let's give you this next one. If an applicant does not have experience or limited experience, what are your, your recommendations for how to present the resume? I think that would honestly depend on the job specifically. Um, we re sometimes require minimum years uh, and that's hard. That's a hard pass if you don't have those years. So just manage your expectations when you're applying for those type of things and you see that on the job description. But also, you know, what type of education, what type of um, professional development have you taken that would relate to that experience, not necessarily on the job titled, but um, maybe outside in your personal life. And, and it's okay to, to reference college courses or projects that you worked on, especially if you're a younger candidate um, coming out of college or, or just fresh into the job market. Okay, Jared, I'm gonna give you the next one here. Um, if you would like to work at a particular company, how can you get around all of the electronic system weed out types of processes to get a conversation with HR or a recruiting professional like you? How do I get a face to face so that I can get the job? Yeah, that's a good question. I know, you know, talking with a lot of individuals over the years, you know, they, they tend to look at it as a black hole. You know, you submit, you submit a resume online and you never hear anything. So yeah, I mean, my advice would be trying to connect with a, with a recruiter if you can. I mean, there's a lot of companies that use their own internal recruiters as well, and it's their job to essentially go out and network with individuals. So, you know, use things like LinkedIn or company websites to try to identify the best contact and then try to send those requests. I mean, I, I would be very surprised if you sent a request to a recruiter on LinkedIn and they didn't want to connect with you, uh, especially if you were someone that was relevant in the field. Thank you. All right, Summer, you're up next. How important are references? Are they make or break? I don't think necessarily think so. I think that, uh, I think it was Jared that mentioned earlier that typically references are going to provide a, a positive reference for a candidate. So it, it at times feels like it can be biased to the candidate. And so I think for, for me, really what comes into play is the candidate's ability to articulate their experience and how it's relevant to that job. Excellent. All right, Mike, back to you. Negotiating at UK due to a limited range and generic job titles, how would you advise? Uh, again, patience. Um, so again, it's, it's big by design. Um, a lot of the positions are going to be more uh, clearly identified based on the supplemental questions uh, that are added onto that application process. Um, so you can see if it's more payroll based or grant based or, or whatever the job really gets down to uh, in the supplemental question. So I'd start there to uh, identify the job itself. Um, and then negotiating, uh, there is almost zero wiggle room uh, with UK's negotiations. Um, everything is determined based on uh, a matrix of uh, the pay grade of the position itself and the, uh, the range of the salary for that grade. 
uh, but then also a combination of your education and related experience um, as it relates to that specific job. Um, so because of that, back to the application, you want to list every job you've ever had, whether you think it applies uh, to a position or not, because it may relate and it may bump your salary up an extra dollar. Um, but again, there's very, very little wiggle room with UK salaries. Um, I think there's less than three or 4% wiggle room on those, uh, if even that, and that's dependent upon many factors. Um, and then also anticipate the lower half of a pay grade as an offer. Um, just kind of rule of thumb. Uh, it's disappointing, but uh, it's just the reality of, of what we do. Appreciate those insights, Mike. All right, Andrea, back to you. Are dates on length of time employed at a company important, or are you more, or are skills more important? Well, I hate to sound like a lawyer and say it depends. Um, <laughs> some of my hiring managers look at dates and they look at your experience. Um, some hiring managers are very finicky and they want to know, was there a gap in, in, in between these positions? Were you only there for six months or were you there for six years? Um, and so I would probably say to err on ca you know, err cautiously and go ahead and put those dates in there. Um, and it can be that, you know, Jan 2019 to Jan 2020 kind of deal it doesn't necessarily have to be the, the 14 Jan, but I would, I would err on the side of caution and put the dates on there. Right. All right, Jared, back to you. What are some of the best and worst questions you hear from job seekers? From job seekers. Um, best questions. I mean, I, I guess maybe wanting to hear about um, what an actual day looks like in the company for a particular job. Um, you know, a lot of times I feel like as a job seeker, you're asking a lot of questions around what what skills are they looking for or, or, or things like that. But if you can really dig down and figure out like what a normal day in the life looks like, I think that's a good question. Um, asking questions about culture anymore. Uh, I mean, so many companies are trying to find good culture fits for their organizations. So, you know, are you a fit not only skill wise, but it, does it align with, you know, kind of your values and, and, and your overall, you know, look at how, how you, where you want to work at. All right, Summer. Um, the panel mentioned to tailor your resume to the specific job. That might have even been you that said that. Um, if you're looking at LinkedIn and the employment experience information is a bit static, is that a concern? Not necessarily. Uh, really, LinkedIn is it's a snapshot in time of your experience. If it's, if it's written in a way that makes sense and you in the summary piece, you can articulate what your experience looks like, then recruiters will oftentimes reach back out and they wanna have a conversation to learn more. Very good. All right, Mike, back to you. If an applicant asks you not to contact a current or former employer, will that look negatively on the applicant? Uh, no. Uh, we understand, uh, especially for current employers, that people want to be cautious or secretive about their job search. We understand that. Um, and references are contacted uh, at some point late in the interview phase, uh, but before an offer is made. So um, by the time we want to reach out to past employers, uh, you'll be aware that you're in the running for the position. Um, and we'll double check and confirm that it is okay or not to, to check a reference or, or past employer. And you can make your own determination from there. Very good. All right, looks like four more. So one more for each of you. Um, let's see, Andrea, you're up next. Um, should you disclose that you're pregnant up front during the interview process or wait until after you receive an offer? I would wait till the offer. I would consider that kind of a, you know, what does what your anticipated start date look like? Uh, you know, some some employees or, or candidates have vacation that they've planned or paid for, and I think that would be the time to bring that up. You know, I might need some time off at this point. Okay, Jared, you're up next. Um, what what would you recommend for follow up after submitting a resume if you don't hear anything back at that stage? I, I think we kind of talked a little bit about it earlier. I, I think fair after two or three days to, to follow back up on those things. Again, anymore where you're doing so many applicants, you know, applying online and, and maybe just waiting to hear back. You know, if you haven't heard anything within two or three days, you know, try to try to reach out to somebody, try to call somebody. 
Very good. And Summer, um, is it okay for recent young college graduates to work with a recruiter if they're interested in particular types of roles? What would you recommend there? You know, I think that yes, short answer is yes. I think what I would recommend is having a short list of specific roles that you're interested in and then reaching out to a recruiter that specializes in those roles. Very good. All right, Mike, last question. Um, I've been with the same company for 25 years looking for a new job due to COVID. Would that 25 years of service be viewed as negative? Not at all. Um, you know, loyalty is a, a big sell uh, at any point. Um, so being there for, for 25 years is a, a big selling factor for us. Um, and also just kind of harp into uh, how you've grown throughout those 25 years in the company. Um, Lots of people are looking for new jobs right now, uh, specifically because of COVID through one way or another. And um, focusing more on what you've uh, given to that company, how you've grown in that company and why you're ready for a new challenge. Uh, they are great topics to cover. Excellent. All right, I think that's all the questions we'll have time to do in the big group. For now, I'd love for our attendees to just flood that chat box with gratitude for our panelists. We so appreciate you all. There are a couple of other questions that have sprinkled in, and if you all want to tag into the chat, you're welcome to, but no pressure there. Um, you're getting lots of love in the chat. I know that's always encouraging and fun to see. And at this time, our panelists can go ahead and mute and go off camera. Ellie, we'll go ahead and pull up the screen share for job leads next. Thank you to our panelists, really appreciate you. All right, next up is job leads. Um, attendees, if you have job leads, feel free to share those via the chat box. If there are any recruiters or employers who have active job leads to share, please use the raise hand feature now. I'll be watching for those. It looks like we might already have one with a raised hand. If you raise hand, you have one minute to share your active job leads. Uh, with the group and we'll promote you up to a panelist. All right, Mike McClonkey, it looks like you have your hand up. I'm gonna promote you up to a panelist now. All right, Mike, you should be able to unmute now. If you wanna turn camera on, you're most welcome to and share your job lead. All right, it looks like might be might be having some tech concerns, so we'll just keep going. Move him back. I'm not seeing any other hands up. Um, for those that registered, please watch for our email this afternoon. We compile a big list of active job leads that have come in in the last couple of weeks since our last job club session and join that LinkedIn group. Sometimes job leads that come in close before the next job club session and we try to keep that up, that group updated with job leads as they come through so be sure to. We'll, what Caroline can you put that into the chat again and we'll approve those requests today. All right next slide Ellie. Um, just a few updates from our job club facilitators as we're wrapping up today. Next slide. Alumni Career Services has a couple of programs coming up. This week is Leadership Week. If you're joining as a part of that series, so glad that you're here. We do have two more sessions later today, two sessions tomorrow and two sessions on Thursday. UKalumni.net forward slash Leadership Week will get you to those descriptions and sessions. We'd love to have you join. And on Wednesday, May the 19th, uh, Azetta Beatty uh, is going to be with us. She's in UKHR as well. And she's going to be talking about the work and parenting dance. The last year has cha challenged our working parents in a unique way. Uh, and so we're going to be having a, a great conversation about that. So we'd love to have you join for that career management webinar series. All right. And next up, I'd love to pass it over to Diana Doggett for extension. Wherever you are, a reminder here that uh, there is a cooperative extension office in your county, in Kentucky, and even nationwide. And so we, uh, we just uh, invite you to check out websites, uh, check out uh, all the programming that's going on. I want to mention a couple uh, that are statewide right now going on. And one is Playing the Hand That You Were Dealt. And it's a series. And 
you know, no matter how bad or, or it could be, uh, there are times when we must take the most of the situation. So this series uh, is really um, uh, signaling in on the pandemic and what it's done to many of us and our families and how we can try to make sense uh, out of a range of some loss and grief that we've experienced. So it's a seven part series. I've put that in the chat box and um, uh, 429 is coming up and it's gonna be self care and nutrition. So we have some great experts from UK dietetics and, and uh, human nutrition. So we would invite you to participate and you can sign up for um, all of the sessions or just attend one. Um, and then last but not least, uh, I'm doing another cook together, a virtual cooking demo. Um, this will be take place on May the 5th at 11 a.m. And we'll be doing a master mix. Uh, we'll feature pancakes and who knows what else. So it'll be a great, great time together. And I invite you to join us. Alrighty, alrighty. So thanks everyone. Uh, I want to say thanks again uh, before sharing job leads here for steps. Uh, thanks to, of course, um, Andrea and Jared Summer, and of course my coworker Mike, who I work beside in Steps Temporary Employment. Uh, awesome, awesome panel today. So we currently have already, oh, sorry, eighty three jobs open. And so, of course, I cannot share all of those. So I'm going to encourage you guys. I'm going to put the link here um, for you to go to UK, our UK jobs webpage to view uh, the many jobs that are open and available for you to apply to. Um, and as Amanda mentioned, I believe some of these will be closing soon. So I tried to put some of these in here that are going to be closing soon that you may be interested in. And so I'm just going to plug that in here. Uh, let's see here. But yes, there are 83 jobs. And so you guys go through and uh, take a look at those uh, from a medical assistant, admin, respiratory therapist, data manager. There are many, many. And uh, we, of course, anticipate these to increase. Um, many of the times this summer is a very, very um, high volume time, I should say, for us in the STEPS office from research positions, healthcare, of course, um, we have COVID going on, and so, the, you know, that doesn't seem to be going anywhere anytime soon, and so we have many supportive services needed for that. Um, so, yeah, feel free to take a look there and um, apply, and we hope to see you guys soon. It was so great to hear about the success stories uh, and how STEPS kind of helped with some of those, and so uh, thank you guys again, and so we definitely want to invite you to our next job club meeting, all righty, and that will be, um, let's, look, let's look here, next time on Job Club, May 11th shine in your next virtual interview. Alrighty, and so that will be very good. We have Mr. Uh, Mark Williams, a career advisor from our Stuckett Career Center. And there is a link embedded here for you guys to go on and register for that. Also, we can't wait to hear about that one. We talked uh, about that some today, uh, our panel did. And so uh, you got a little, a little head start there. And so we, we're hoping that you come back and hear more from Mark about um, virtual interviews. Alrighty, so I hope you had some great takeaways today. Thank you all again. It was a great panel. Thank you, Mike, our coworker, of course, for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you guys again. Thank you so much. Have a good day.